Hello there, welcome back to Jan's English class and today this video is going to be a little different because today you will be watching a compilation of, of some of my top videos here on Jan's English class, my YouTube channel. And so today I will be gathering some top English videos. Some I think are really useful, are core for English learning to give to you. I've made over 2021. I started YouTube from like five or six months ago and things have been going great. Thank you so much for everyone who has subscribed to my channel. If you have not yet subscribed, go do that right now. And please make sure to like this video to show your support. So now let's look at some videos I've created over the past 2021 year. Welcome 2022. I'm really excited. I hope COVID-19 will get better and end soon. So let's go ahead and watch. Welcome back to my channel, Janet's English Class. Today, you will be learning how to describe art using some very advanced adjectives. This is sort of an artistic lesson, and for each artistic element, I'm going to show you a painting, a picture, and I'm going to give you some adjectives to describe the art. Let's get started. All right, so our first artistic element that we're going to use English vocabulary to describe is this painting over here, which is talking about color. So the first thing I feel when I look at this painting is that the color is so garish. Garish means something is bold, it is striking. It has a lot of strokes of color in here and it's so bright, it's colorful, it, is, makes, me, it, makes, me, it makes me happy. And the colors and the spectrum is very saturated. Saturated means varying from all spectrums of color. Yet, the color is quite clashing. Clashing is like a storm. The rain is clashing onto the ground. It's like a straightforward painting with so many vibrant colors in it. We can call this clashing. And next, we have the word vivid. Vivid is used to describe something very bright, joyful, vibrant, and yet the colors in this painting is vivid because there's a variety of colors from red to black, all colors in between. And yet, our last vocabulary is stimulating. When you feel stimulated, you must have saw something very amazing. So if I say, Oh, this food is stimulating, which won't actually describe. This painting is stimulating because it has such bright, vibrant colors. Sorry, I keep repeating those words. Because this painting has specifically a lot of rainbow kind of textured colors that make it stimulating. All right, so that is it for our color section. Let's move on to our next section. All right, our next element is tone. Look at this painting. What is the tone of this painting? When I say tone, tone means how the artist received and drew down this painting. So the tone might be graduated. In this painting, like from brown, kind of blackish kind of colors, and the tone is graduated. It's kind of smooth. It is uniform. Uniform is like it's tidy. Even though the composition is not tidy, the tone is, so that is an oxymoron. Note that down. So the tone and texture is kind of unvarying. It's only from white to brown. Specifically, the tone is just smooth and it doesn't like vary from like rocky to smooth or glossy to smooth and so it is unvarying and yet it is monochromatic monochromatic means that it doesn't really have a bunch of colors in it it is smooth it is plain it is you know normal and yet the tone this is a hard description broken 
Why would we call this broken? Well, this painting is broken because the, you know, the way it, get, if you, it lets you feel and the way that the artist has drew this painting, it is broken. The object is still alive. It is broken and the artists have done a great job using tone to describe the painting. All right, our next artistic element that we're going to be learning about and describing in English is composition. So composition is the arrangement of something. So a composition of books, a, com a composition of dresses, you know, anything. So take a look at this painting over here. What do you see in this painting? Some ballerinas and a male and the male coach training these ballerinas. So, how can we describe the composition in this painting? So, we can describe it as horizontal. Horizontal is the opposite of vertical. Vertical is portrait, and horizontal is landscape. So, this painting is horizontal, and it is also background. Now, background in this painting Background means the, it's sort of like a background. If it's foreground, that means you're actually close to the character. And so here it is background. We're viewing a background. We're viewing a scene from a third person's point of view. And the painting is spacious. There's a lot of space between the ballerinas. And there's a lot of walls. And the space is wide. It's widely ranged. And it's also balanced. The ballerina's legs are in the same height, and the walls and the ceilings, and all the ballerinas are mostly the same height, so it's balanced. And it's also in a landscape format, like I mentioned before. It is in the landscape. The format is landscape, the opposite of vertical. Let's move on to our next segment. All right, our next thing that we're going to be learning about is the texture. How do we describe a texture of a painting? Take a look at this famous painting. You might have seen this painting before. It is called The Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. Now, how would we describe the texture of this painting? For me, it seems polished. Texture is, you know, kind of like the emotion and feeling, the strokes of paint at the that the artist is trying to perceive. So the paint is polished, strokes of paint. It is also glossy, kind of bright, and kind of like smooth. It is also curved, like this little wave-like night, night sky in the background. And I would also describe this kind of fuzzy, that little dot of blue paint. It's fuzzy, it is soft, it's, it gives me this light feeling. It's polished, glossy, curved, fuzzy, and soft. It depends on the painting. So those are the words that I would use to describe this painting over here, the texture. All right, so our last fragment of art that we're going to be looking at today, describing in English, is the mood and atmosphere. So look at this painting. It's kind of abstract. It's like maybe a picture of a beach painting of a beach and as you can see this painting has directed its mood and atmosphere to something a bit sad so how would we use some advanced vocabulary to describe it so we can describe this as tearful the shades of gray makes me feel sad it makes me feel you know miserable all right so we can describe this as tearful miserable Maybe a bit of gloom is added in this painting because of the texture and the colors used. A bit of somberness, somber, and insipid. Insipid is a very important vocabulary. Insipid means there's no joy, it's plain, it's somber, it's normal, it's ordinary. There's no joy or happiness inside this painting. It's more of you know, I think it's trying to depict a sad moment or maybe, you know, like a gloomy scene. So that is the mood and the atmosphere. 
lastly, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you learned something. And I spent a lot of time making this video for you to learn how to describe art in English. Art is beautiful. I love art. What about you? Let me know in my website chat box. You can check out Janice English Courses. And I'm going to tell you a bit about my midterm break. So in school, we have a midterm break in the um, half of a sem semester. We have a little, little vacation holiday for a week. I went to a hotel with my parents, my family, and I also went to a sleepover with my friends, which was really fun. So I really hope you enjoyed this video lastly, and thank you for watching. See you guys next time. Like always, I post every weekend, and I'll see you guys next weekend, or maybe in a few days. Bye! channel and today this is the video that I've always wanted to video and firstly welcome back to Janet's English class and today I will be talking about the concept of comedy and firstly I want to advertise Kindle in quarantine we've all been wanting to read and we can't go to the bookstores to buy novels but with Kindle you can do a lot of great stuff and you can buy a lot of books on here or you can read for free. It has all sorts of functions. You can read like a lot of books, you can read it for free and if and you can go to libraries. You can take a look at it. It's very useful to help you read and improve your English. Although, and oh, and also the quality is really good, you can choose the cover you want. Mine is black, and I share it with my dad. It's really useful, I have a lot of books in here. Okay, so now let's move on to the main concept of today, the concept of comedy. So this is some, I did some research and I found out like, why do we laugh when we hear some jokes or some English humor. Okay, comedy is a concept of fiction in which the dramatic works cause humans to laugh. This consists of discourses including laughter, amusement, and theatrical details. When our youth subside between joy and sadness, the mix between the sides formed using jokes and riddles make us happy. And humor is combined of popular genres and humiliating forms. The characterized statement gives us humans a twist to our minds, making us wonder. In society, the concept is not yet defined fully, for, for depicting studies of laughter would be a slight issue. Satire and political satire portrays a social institution in which the humor is unexpected and bizarre. Embarrassing situations give us relation in our lives or make us giggle about the misfits. Study shows that people laugh over misfortune more than they do from harmless puns. There are several comedy genres, romantic, dramatic, action, and horror. An example of romantic humor is like a man having hiccups during his proposal. Dramatic humor is like a girl reacting to her friend's joke without saying anything. An example of action humor is like a dog chasing a bird when it's actually just a toy. An example of horror humor is like a man getting scared by a noise when it's just his baby sister. Comedy comes in all shapes and sizes. It counts on if you laugh or not. Comedians try their best to amuse us, but the slightest basic things in life are the ones that amuse us most. Tell me if you don't understand my lessons. Haha, <laughs> get it? Don't. Okay, thanks for watching this video. I hope you learned a little bit about comedy. Comment in the discussion which 
comedian you've heard before, and which one made you laugh the most. I hope you've learned something helpful, and please subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and like this video. Thanks for watching, and remember to get one of the Kindles. They are free for discount. And please check out my website, and my blog, and my flashcards, and my worksheets. You can edit them. Okay, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye! Welcome back to my channel and today I will be doing a book analysis on a series of unfortunate events, the Hostel Hospital. So I have read this book fully and I have watched the Netflix episode. It was awesome, the book and the, the movie was awesome. So I'm going to be sharing this book with you guys. So firstly, we have to know the characters of the book. In this book, there are a few characters. Lila Baudelaire, Klaus Baudelaire, and Sonny Baudelaire, Count Olaf Baudelaire, and his troop. So, overall, a, a series of unfortunate events is about some orphans, which is on a long, long trek in order to stop Count Olaf from getting their hand from getting his hands on their fortune. Technically, I would consider the Baudelaire's rich. They live in a big mansion, but their parents died in a fire. Sadly, and now they are in charge under a banker named Mr. Poe. So, the Hostel Hospital is about a story of when the Baudelaire's orphans left from the last book, the while the, the Yes, the Vile Village, and they ran into a hospital, and VFD is the long, long, long wanted answer of the Baudelaire's, because they don't know what it stands for, and that keeps a huge secret on their family. So when they, they, when they catch a red herring, red herring is a false clue, the Baudelaire children miserably gets caught by Count Olaf in a shop quickly ran, run to a van that says VFD and they get tricked they thought it was the actual answer to the problem but no it's not it's just a weird strange troop that sings happy songs to the hospital members now this book also contains Esme Squalor which is Count Olaf's girlfriend formerly became her and this book is actually pretty awesome, so let's dive deeper into it. So technically, a series of unfortunate if it's awesome, this book is particularly awesome for its general idea. Like, this book was written a long time ago, but the idea was great. Like, at, at the moment when Klaus is forced to cut off her sister's head for chemotherapy, I remember it's one thing. This whole hospital relies on one thing. Paperwork. Klaus uses this this form, this subject, to inform everyone like, oh, we have to do this first. To keep it as excuse. There's a lot of irony used in this book. Dramatic irony. And look at the back. Before I throw away this awful book, it is indeed miserable. Some parts I cried, because it's kind of miserable, and I'm on the Baudelaire team, of course. So basically, I won't tell you the whole story, but basically, the the um, front desk of the hospital gets kidnapped by Count Olaf's troop and Esme in a secret room, so no one can get in. And Violet is captured with them, too. And she gets an Anastasia. I don't know how to pronounce it. Anastasia. Let's just say that. And she's basically asleep. So, and Klaus decides if Count Olaf can pull off all these cool costumes, then I can too. The Baudelaire children are very smart, of course. 
and indeed Klaus thought of an idea. So what Klaus did was he needed to search for his sister, so he used anagrams. So anagrams are when you find words in a word, like watermelon. Of course he would say there's the word water inside or melon inside. Connected together and there's words inside. So he finally used the anagram system with his sister, baby sister, Sunny, and they found his sister. But just then, the Count Olaf troops barged in and said, oh, you're a doctor, right? Okay, they do this chemotherapy on this girl, which is his own sister. So there's a plot twist and super exciting moment to this book, and they, and I won't tell you the ending, pretty surprising, pretty intense. So overall, I thought this was a great book, and I would totally recommend it to all of you. I would do, I try to do more book analyses, since I saw a lot of people do it on YouTube. So, me too! Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye! Picture this, you're in the rain, it's drenching wet, it's raining cats and dogs, and then your friend says, lovely weather out here today, and then she says, great choice for an umbrella, which is ironic, and which is sarcasm, do you know, let's discuss. everyone, welcome back for another lesson on Janet's English class. I'm Janet, and today the topic we'll be discussing is types of humor in English. If someone said to you, the police station got robbed, well of course that is unfortunate, but how is that funny in some way? Before we start today's lesson, I would like to mention that I have created a YouTube transcript for today's lesson on Janet's English courses, and I will link it down in the description below. Now, time for today's lesson. Firstly, we're going to look at irony. Irony is a humorous expression explained through using language that signifies the opposite, and it provokes a comic effect. So, there are three types of irony, there is verbal irony, situational irony, and dramatic irony. So, an example of verbal irony would be, Awesome, I have another 10-page essay to write. Okay, so the proper definition for verbal irony is involving irony through the opposite through something's actual definition. Alright, next we have situational irony. Situational irony is when the situation or the outcome of something is surprisingly different from the, what the reader or audience anticipated. So, an example would be, do you know the story The Turtle and the Hare? Alright, so who exactly won in the end? A turtle, right? The turtle won the hare in the story, a hare is a rabbit. The turtle won the hare in the story, and the hare was being lazy and sleeping beside it, so the turtle won in the end. That is an example of situational irony. Lastly, we have dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is when the audience knows something about the character, and the audience can see that, you know, something is happening, but the character doesn't. So it's actually pretty awkward and funny sometimes. I can think of an example from Romeo and Juliet. But here is an easier example. A girl tries hiding her cookies from her sister. But the, the audience can see that. The sister, the, the smaller sister, can see it all. Whereas the girl hiding the cookies doesn't have a clue. That is an example of dramatic irony. So, have you heard of or seen this kind of irony before? Irony can be used verbally, orally, or it can be acted out. 
So situational irony and dramatic irony is more commonly used in movies or books or plays. Verbal irony would be orally spoken in everyday life. That is irony. All right, next we're gonna be talking about self-deprecating humor. So this is a very common humor actually, and I do it all the time. So self-deprecating humor is when someone basically makes fun of themselves. It is done in a way in which a person speaking is very humble to laugh at themselves. So here's an example of self-deprecating humor. You might have heard this very long quote before. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, which is a pity because this week the National Association of Beholders wrote to me saying that I have a face like a rucksack full of dented bells by Charlie Brooker. This quote was said by Charlie Brooker and yeah, even myself, I don't really find that funny, but self-deprecating humor is indeed to make someone laugh and it's a very common and easy way for you to make someone laugh. Self-deprecating humor. All right, so next we're gonna be looking at my favorite kind of humor so far, the witty remarks. So witty remarks are retorts, retort, which is a witty remark, spoken to provoke a smart and humorous effect. So for example, someone says, if I can't just see one color, what is it called? And then someone else says, depends on the color. And the first speaker again says, that's what I'm unsure about. <laughs> so right here is an example of, of witty remarks. There are actually a lot of witty remarks examples on the internet. On, I find them on Twitter. I find them like everywhere. And in the modern world, the witty remarks are really common nowadays, and it's to provoke, it's to provoke a humorous effect, and I do it all the time. So that is a witty remark. All right, next we're looking at sarcasm. Oh, sarcasm. Sarcasm means the use of irony to convey a sense of obvious humor and contempt, mocking, or ridicule. So, if someone is being sarcastic, they might say something like this. The food was brilliant. The plate was cold. The food was raw. And the utensils weren't clean. Alright, so sarcasm and irony, the difference between them is that sarcasm is more provoking an obvious effect. Irony is kind of making, kind of like deadpan humor. You're saying it with a straight face, and you know, it's like, if, if you go back to irony, and it, it's actually a humorous expression used for language, signifying the opposite. So irony and sarc sarcasm is really different. It provokes a comic effect, and but usually it's something opposite through its actual definition. How should I say this? Sarcasm is used to like for example if we go back to what I said in the beginning lovely weather out here today it's raining it's raining and then sarcasm is great choice for an umbrella of course you would bring an umbrella I mean it's raining so hard and the irony is lovely weather out here today it's the opposite so I hope you know the difference between irony and sarcasm all right Thank you so much for watching this video. We have reached the end of an amazing video that was so fun to teach. And today I hope you have learned um, a lot of kinds of humor in English. Please subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and like this video. Make sure to check out the YouTube transcript and check out new podcast episodes on Janet's writing podcast. Check out Janet's English courses learn some English there. Alright, and that's it. I'll see you guys next time. Bye! Alright, thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate you watching it. 
And yeah, please subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and like this video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!